This is Love Notes, daily devotions from Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Grace and peace to you. Our text today is from the second chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 12. Jesus has come home, we're told, to Capernaum again. After a busy first chapter establishing his authority and giving us a vision of what his mission, at least a little bit, is supposed to be about, he comes back to Capernaum, probably to rest, and it's reported that he was at home, it tells us. Now, when they hear that he's at home, it says in verse 2, so many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even at the front door. He was speaking the words so that people could overhear him inside, outside, all around, but nobody can get close. Verse 3 says, then some people, they're not named, they came and they bring to him a paralyzed man and they carry him on a pallet, four of them. Now, they've heard about Jesus and they think that their friend can be helped. I am struck, as Amy Jo Levine is in her book, Signs and Wonders, about these four. They care enough about this man, not about themselves, but about this man who's laying on the pallet and can't move, that they bring him to Jesus, hoping that he can be helped. Now, they can't find any way to get to Jesus. There isn't a way to get a note in. There's no way that they can deal with this crowd. So somewhere, one of them, maybe all of them, look up and notice that the roof is open. Uh, not open, open, but that there's nobody up there. So they climb up to the roof. And in ancient Palestine at this point, it would have been a, a, a roof made of, of mud and and the materials that you made a house out of uh, that was set around a frame of sticks and wood. So they get up there and they start to dig through the roofing material. They removed the roof above him and after having dug through it, it says, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. Uh, you can almost envision the whole circumstance. Jesus standing there in the middle of the house, the house surrounded by uh, a whole crowd, a mob of people, and all of a sudden he looks up with dirt falling from somewhere and notices that there's a man being lowered on some strings by his friends so that Jesus can see him. This is faith. Not the faith of the man, we don't know anything about that, but the faith of the men who lowered him down to make this effort, knowing that Jesus could do something. He says to the man, when he says, see, saw their faith in verse 5, child, your sins are forgiven. It seems a strange thing to say. Obviously, the paralysis is what gets our attention the most. We should be very careful here not to think that what Jesus is saying is that his sin has laid some punishment of paralysis upon him. Uh, that isn't really how ancient people thought, and it's not what we should think today. The idea that sin causes people to get sick is dangerous. It's evil. That the folks at the cancer hospital or the folks who are having congestive heart failure uh, did this to themselves and their own sin is let this punishment upon them is a very dangerous kind of way to look at something which is not faith but is about kind of a determinism. All it does is to make the person making the judgment feel better. Now, it's, it's true that we know enough about medicine that we can engage in all kinds of unhealthy behaviors that will, in fact, lead to consequences of ill health. But that isn't God's doing. No, I think what's happening here is that Jesus knows the crowd, and Jesus knows that when we are cast out and paralyzed, that our lives can get filled with a whole lot more problems than just not being able to move our legs, we begin to hate ourselves. We begin to hate our lives. We begin to despair and grieve whatever we might have lost. And each of those things draws us further and further away from God, which is ultimately what sin is all about. 
Jesus also knows that there's people watching. And so I think he pokes the bear a little bit. He provokes them. So he says, child, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes that were there, they were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They make a huge assumption here, and this is not classically, in my opinion, and those of other commentators, uh, any kind of blasphemy at all. Jesus does not say, I forgive your sins. He doesn't claim that power. He says, your sins are forgiven. Does that mean that he's doing it? No, it means more likely that God does that. He's declaring a truth. No matter what it is that separates you in this world, God has forgiven you. God brings you close. Go back to the baptism and the words that Jesus heard. This is my son. With you, I am well pleased. I think that's what he's saying to this man. There's nothing to separate you from God, not even your paralysis. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus perceives this, we're told, in his spirit, that they were discussing these questions and arguing. And so he asked, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? And here's what I think Jesus was setting up. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, which is just a statement of fact, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? Which one do you want to sign up to do? I can do the first. As a pastor, I've been sent by the church to declare the forgiveness of sins to anybody who will listen. But to make a paralytic walk, that seems a little bit harder. And then Jesus says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, now he's going to claim that authority in the name of God. He looks at the paralytic and says, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And that's exactly what he does. Jesus establishes his authority in an even wider circle here. Jesus uses this occasion as a way of saying that to say that you, your paralysis is no longer here is also to say your sins are forgiven. That the one who has the authority to do one has the authority to do the other. That in the kingdom of God, not only will the lame walk, but all will be brought into the presence of God they will be reconciled, accepted, and loved as children. Now, this is still a controversy. Jesus breaks all kinds of boundaries. This whole story is about boundary breaking. They break through the roof to get to Jesus. And then Jesus breaks the boundaries to free people so that they can be who God created them to be, up and walking, forgiven and full of hope. This is still a big controversy. There are many in the church and outside the church who think that it's the business of faithful people to not forgive, but to condemn. And Jesus will have none of it. Jesus claims the whole person. The paralysis, the pain, the grief, the suffering, wraps it all up, embraces it in his arms, and heals it all. That's why I love the Jesus in Mark's gospel. Hmm? Let us pray. Gracious God, you know all of us, not just our sickness. You know all of us, not just the things that annoy. And you embrace all of us as children of the Most High God and announce that God is pleased with us, and so you free every inch of us, so that not only can we walk away from our pallets, but that we can walk away unbound from our sins. Thanks be to God. Amen.